Hello, everyone. My name is John Jarko, and I'm a deputy editor at the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm speaking during this year's European Society of Cardiology's virtual Congress called ESC Congress 2020, The Digital Experience. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to tell you a little bit about some of the major clinical trials we are publishing online simultaneously with their ESC meeting presentation. The first trial I would like to discuss is called the EAST AFNET4 trial. This was a randomized trial in 2,789 patients with atrial fibrillation who were at increased cardiovascular risk. The trial evaluated a treatment strategy of early rhythm control in which patients were treated with antiarrhythmic drugs or AF ablation early after randomization. The comparison group turned to usual care, emphasized rate control, and limited rhythm control to management of symptoms. Oral anticoagulation was recommended for all patients. There were two primary endpoints. The first primary endpoint was a composite of cardiovascular death, stroke, or hospitalization with worsening heart failure or an acute coronary syndrome. The second primary endpoint was the number of nights spent in hospital per year. At a median of 5.1 years, the first primary outcome occurred in 249 patients in the early rhythm control group and in 316 patients in the usual care group for rates of 3.9% per year and 5% per year, respectively. This event rate reduction with early rhythm control was statistically significant. The second primary endpoint of number of nights spent in hospital was 5.8 per year with early rhythm control and 5.1 per year with usual care, a difference that was not statistically significant. This trial therefore suggests that for patients with atrial fibrillation who are at increased cardiovascular risk, early rhythm control reduces the risk of adverse cardiovascular events. The second trial I would like to discuss is called Emperor Reduced. This was a randomized trial in 3,730 patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Patients were randomized to receive the SGLT2 inhibitor empagliflozin at a dose of 10 milligrams once daily, or placebo. SGLT2 inhibitors are, of course, approved for use as anti-diabetes drugs. But in this trial, only about half of the participants had diabetes, and the purpose of the trial was to assess whether empagliflozin would be beneficial regardless of diabetes status. The primary outcome was a composite of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for worsening heart failure. At a median follow-up of 16 months, the primary outcome occurred in 19.4% of patients in the empagliflozin group and in 24.7% of patients in the placebo group. This difference was statistically significant. In a subgroup analysis, there was no evidence that the presence of diabetes influenced the benefit of empagliflozin. This trial, together with the previous similar trial of dapagliflozin called DAPA-HF, makes a strong case that SGLT2 inhibitors should be considered a potential part of the heart failure armamentarium. The last trial that I would like to mention is called LODOCO2. This was a randomized trial in 5,522 patients with evidence of coronary artery disease at at least six months of clinical stability. Patients were randomized to either colchicine at a dose of 0.5 milligrams once daily or matching placebo. The primary endpoint was a composite of cardiovascular death, spontaneous myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, and ischemia-driven coronary revascularization. At a median follow-up of 29 months, the primary endpoint occurred in 6.8% of patients allocated to colchicine and in 9.6% of patients allocated to placebo. This difference was statistically significant. There was a non-significantly higher rate of non-cardiovascular death in the colchicine group. Another recent trial of colchicine, the Colcott trial, also found a benefit of this ancient drug in patients who were within 30 days of a myocardial infarction. Both trials point to the important role that inflammation plays in the pathogenesis of coronary artery disease. These are just a few of the trials that are being published online in the New England Journal of Medicine to coincide with presentations at the Virtual European Society of Cardiology Congress. For more information, please visit our website at nejm.org.